Yeah, I'm talking. Uh, scroll down and let me see what the title of your message is. Uh, right here, Judgment on the Wicked Rich. Okay. Six o'clock. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, good to see you all again. Uh, this morning I had the opportunity to go over to Hillsboro, Missouri and meet with our brothers and sisters at uh, Blues Creek Chapel. And they send their greetings and uh, they really look forward to seeing some of our guys come over and share again as uh, they have gotten started. Uh, hopefully we will be able to do the same soon. Uh, not only did we get to uh, spend Sunday school together and then church, uh, but then we had a chili and salad luncheon afterwards and it was a good time of fellowship. Well, in the midst of everything that is going on, um, one of the things that, uh, I've heard a lot about, a lot of complaints, especially from younger people in the body, is uh, the idea of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. And there's lots of problems with the thinking, uh, but there's also a measure of truth uh, to uh, some of that thinking. So tonight, as we're in James chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, we're going to be dealing with judgment on the wicked rich. Uh, I know some people think that all rich people are wicked. We'll find as we look at scripture that is not true, uh, but there are those that are. So let's uh, start with uh, James 5, 1 through 6, and then I'll pray. Come now, you rich people, weep and wail over the miseries that are coming on you. Your wealth is ruined uh, and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your silver and gold are uh, corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You stored up treasure in the last days. Look and pay that uh, you uh, look, the pay that you withheld from the workers who reaped your fields cries out, and the outcry of the harvesters has reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived luxuriously on your land and have indulged yourselves. You have fattened your hearts for the day of slaughter. You have condemned uh, and have murdered the righteous man. He does not resist you. Let's open in a word of prayer. Father, as we come this evening, we once again thank you for the opportunity to come together to uh, listen to your word and your spirit. We would ask, Father, that your spirit would guide and direct us in our understanding, uh, not only of this passage, but how we may be guilty of some of these same things. Uh, we recognize we may not do it, be doing it the way they did, but uh, the riches that we have are that which you have provided. And we understand that you are the owner of all and we are stewards. So if we are in any way guilty, Lord, we want to align ourselves with your spirit and with your word uh, so that you might be honored and glorified in all that goes on in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Uh, Rich, uh, Jesus said in Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Uh, in Matthew 6, 19 to 21, he says, he warns, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven 
where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. In context, uh, Matthew 6, 22 to 23 teaches that the cap, uh, what captivates the eye or the heart controls the whole person. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If, th if therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So we see uh, several verses here in the same passage talking about the importance of where our heart is set, where our treasures are, and the fact that you cannot have God and the pursuit of what this world has to offer on the same page because they don't fit. God does not condemn people being rich. Think about it with me. Some of his servants, he blessed financially, uh, materially in a great way. I, I think of Abraham. Uh, Abraham, uh, there's a famine. He goes down into Egypt. Uh, while he's there, he gets all kinds of blessings. Uh, one of those blessings was Hagar, servant of uh, Sarah. Uh, the reality is, is if he had been listening to God, maybe he wouldn't have gone down to Egypt in the process, but God still blesses him through that process. So uh, being rich is not the problem. Uh, he's blessed many of his followers. James, like the Old Testament prophets, rebukes these wicked wealthy people who misuse their wealth and abuse the poor or less fortunate than them. Uh, Isaiah, in uh, Isaiah chapter 10, verses 1 to 4, it says, Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees. Sounds like Isaiah was uh, prophesying in America in the 21st century. Who write misfortune, which they have prescribed to rob the needy of justice and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey and that they may rob the fatherless. What will you do in the day of punishment and in the day of desolation, which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help? And where will you leave your glory? Without me, they shall bow down among the prisoners. They shall uh, fall among the slain. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Amos, another prophet of the Old Testament, says in chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, uh, who are on the mountains of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, bring wine, let us drink. And the Lord uh, God has sworn by his holiness, behold, the day shall come upon you when he will take you away with fish hooks and your posterity with fish hooks. You will go out through the broken walls each one straight ahead of her, and you will be cast into Harmon, says the Lord. Uh, you know, when I deal with the people in our benevolence ministry, to see what the state offers these people as a monthly uh, paycheck, if you will, and to think that they're supposed to somehow uh, take care of their families with this. I, I know they think they're doing people good because they're giving them money. Uh, wouldn't it be better to have a job? I know some of these people wouldn't work. Fine. If a man won't work, he shouldn't eat. But to oppress the poor, to put them in a situation where they are hurt because you withhold what is uh, good is uh, something that God hates. Again, in Amos chapter 8, verses 4 to 10, he says, Hear this, you who swallow up the needy and make the poor of the land fail, saying, when will the new moon be passed uh, that we may sell grain and the Sabbath that we may trade wheat, making the ephah small and the shekel large, falsifying the scales by deceit, that we may buy the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals, even sell the bad wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their works. Shall the land not tremble for this? and everyone mourn who dwells in it, all of it shall swell like the river, heave and subside like the river of Egypt. 
And it shall come to pass in that day, says the Lord, that I will make the sun go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in broad daylight. I will turn your feast into mourning and your songs into lamentation. I will bring sackcloth on every waist and baldness, heads up, on every head. I will make it like mourning for an only son and its end like a bitter day. Uh, imagine again in this particular situation, the judgments of the end time, part of the reason why they're coming is because of the way some rich have dealt with poor people. So uh, these are just a few of God's thoughts on the wicked rich. James starts with a strong warning of judgment in verse one. Uh, he starts with come now. We uh, talked about that last week. That basically means listen up. Now, who's he talking to? He's talking to the rich people. He tells them to weep and howl. Uh, the word for weep there is clio, uh, to sob, to wail aloud, to bewail, to weep, as if someone died. Again, uh, my time in Brazil, going to a funeral of someone that was without hope, who didn't know the Lord, when they put that coffin in the ground and they started throwing dirt on it. You know, a lot of funerals here, they, they, uh, everybody leaves before the coffin is even set into the hole. Uh, down there, the body is in the ground within 24 hours of death. And because they don't know Christ, they don't have hope. When, that, when they start throwing the dirt in, someone in the family breaks down and they wail. And it's a, it's a horrible thing. And this is what James is telling the rich people to do to wail and howl. The word for howl here is oaluza, uh, luzu, to howl, to uh, halu, uh, that is shriek or howl. And it's only used here in the New Testament and refers to shrieking or screaming. If you've ever lived in the city, not, not St. Louis, but I used to live in New York City for a period of time. And uh, there are a, a variety of sounds that come forth. And if you happen to be in the wrong area, you may hear someone scream because they're being attacked in an, uh, an alley or something like that. So the two used together picture an intense outburst of despairing, violent, uncontrollable grief. Now, why is he telling them to have this uncontrollable grief? He says, for your miseries that are coming upon you. The word for miseries there is uh, teliporia. It kind of looks like tilapia, but it's a little bit different. Uh, it means wretchedness, that is calamity or misery. It is used here and in Romans 3.16. And James warns, uh, uh, James' warning here mirrors uh, Luke chapter 6, verses 24 and 25, where Jesus says, But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full, for you shall hunger. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. So that is our introduction. Uh, this passage is uh, one that, especially in this day and age, where we see uh, a lot of rich people in places of authority, uh, to think that out of 435 uh, representatives and 100 senators, to recognize that a good majority of them are better than millionaires. They're multimillionaires, and they're there to represent the poor people of this country, to represent anyone from this country. And, and does it seem, when you look at how they do business, does it seem that they are representing us, that they are caring for us? So this message may apply to some of them. And I recognize that there are some that are rich, uh, that are uh, saved, that are doing what they can to help people. But when uh, a good majority of them may fall into this category, not much is going to get done. Notice, first of all, in letter A, we have their wealth was uselessly hoarded. Uh, hoarding seems to be one of the most widespread sins of our time. Uh, just recently, with the coronavirus situation, uh, what was the thing that was hoarded the most? Don't know why, but for whatever reason, everybody felt as though they needed toilet paper. Uh, it's kind of amazing. Uh, the first time I went shopping shortly after this whole thing came into effect, uh, I really wondered if uh, Bernie Sanders was already the president because shelves were empty. I had never been in stores like that before, not even in Brazil, where they are a socialistic type country. 
um, where the shelves were empty, where you're limited on what you can buy. Instead of going shopping every couple of weeks, now I have to go every couple of days because uh, we like eggs and you can only buy two dozen at a time, uh, that kind of a thing. Uh, it's just crazy uh, when you think about it, but here we are in that kind of a situation and both poor people are doing it, but also rich people. Uh, what did we hear about shortly around the time of the start of the coronavirus where we had at least three congressmen, and I'm sure there were probably more, but these three got caught, where they determined that they were going to take basically all their money out of the stock market uh, because they heard about what was going on with Russia and Iran with the oil situation. And so they saved themselves lots of money by getting their money out of the, well, mind you, they didn't tell anybody else. Of course, you're not allowed to tell anybody else, that kind of thing. But again, hoarding, and uh, it seems to be a problem. Notice number two here, three main ways of wealth uh, was valued in James's day. First of all, he uses the word riches. The word riches here is plutos, wealth as fullness. It could be money, but it was probably more along the lines of possessions, abundance, uh, richness, uh, a valuable bestowment. Um, so uh, how he describes them though, is they're, the riches are gonna uh, perish, they're corrupted. The word there is sepo, to putrefy, to perish, uh, to be corrupted. So it's probably dealing more with the concept of food items. You know, we again are a wealthy country. Uh, I'm told we throw out more food every year than what some countries produce in a year. I can tell you that when I went down to Brazil, a, a five pound bag of rice cost about uh, $5. Uh, a, a couple pound bag of beans. Now rice and beans are the staple there. A couple pound uh, bag of beans probably ran a, a couple of dollars. And um, by the time we had left, the minimum wage was $150 a month when we started there. And when we left, it was $150. The problem was rice had gone up 300%. Beans had gone up 300%. Their pay had not increased at all. So the poor people who lived on rice and beans got to a point where they couldn't afford it. Uh, still like rice and beans, we still have it here, but uh, we do not have rice and beans being thrown out, uh, at least here in our house. But uh, so the rich people, they have lots of food. They have access and availability, that kind of thing. Uh, the second thing he talks about is their garments. The word there is hemation, uh, a dress, inner or an outer, apparel, cloak, clothes, garment, raiment, robe, vesture. And again, uh, what kind of clothes did rich people have? They didn't have just a, a burlap bag. They had nice clothes, clothes that were made of purple, that kind of thing. And uh, these clothes were often handed down as heirlooms. Uh, you know, we like to hand down furniture as heirlooms or something like that. They would hand down their clothes. And it says here that uh, the clothes were setubratos or moth-eaten. Uh, so they, they, they didn't have mothballs at the time, apparently, uh, but uh, that was what was going to be coming upon them. And also he talks about their gold and their silver. Uh, gold and silver, when we think about it, for the most part, the, the concept of being indestructible. Yes, you can melt them down, but you still have gold, you still have silver, that kind of a thing. Well, in this particular case, it says that their gold and silver was going to rust or corrode or canker. The word there is uh, kati, Oy -o. Um, coins of the day were not normally pure uh, gold or silver. They contained alloys and therefore uh, they could rust. So James could be speaking of the fact that the gold and silver will be useless in the day of judgment. Uh, so of course with their clothes and their food. So those were three main ways of valuing wealth in that day. And uh, notice he personifies rust uh, here in verses two and three. He talks about their corrosion. It is a witness for the prosecution. That's the way he's writing it in the Greek there. And it'll be a witness against you. So uh, obviously God is looking at all that they have. 
uh, seeing the corrosion that they have so much, they haven't done anything with it, that it's sat there and corroded, and that is going to be a witness against them. Uh, it's also uh, showing it to be an executioner. It says, and it will eat your flesh like fire. The word for flesh here is plural. It's indicating that James is not speaking collectively to a group of people, but to a bunch of individuals. He's letting them know that each of them are going to be paying the price here. Uh, number four, you have heaped up treasure in the last day. So uh, we see here that this encompasses the time between Christ's first and his second coming. Uh, the, the concept of the last day, Paul wrote about it as though it was in his day. John uh, said that he was living in the last days even then because they had false teachers. So it's, uh, uh, it's encompassing the whole time between Christ's first coming, resurrection, ascension, all the way to his second coming. Uh, and hoarding without considering God's timetable. We read Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21 uh, last week, dealing with the uh, farmer that uh, he had gotten so blessed uh, materialistically through his uh, agricultural uh, uh, proceeds that he decided to build bigger barns. And once everything was in the barns, he was thinking, wow, now I'm kind of set. And, and God says, you fool, tonight your soul is required of you. Uh, so he was ultimately going to leave that to someone else. So that's the concept of hoarding without considering God's timetable. Letter B, their wealth was unjustly gained. Uh, again, it's not a matter of being rich. It's how you got it, how you use it. So we see here the scriptural teaching on uh, dealings with the poor. In Deuteronomy 15, 9 to 11, again, not going to read all the verses, but it basically talks about having an open hand to the poor. When people come in for our benevolence ministry, um, the first thing we try and do is find out what we can about the actual bill. And then if we can make a pledge for a certain amount and it puts them in good standing with whoever uh, they owe money to, we do so. If they need more than we can make a pledge, we let them know, look, as soon as you get this amount, and you can get it from other organizations, or you can go out and work for it and that kind of thing, we will take care of uh, the amount that we've decided we'll help you with. We even let the people that they owe money to uh, know we're on for this much if they can uh, get this much more. Uh, we have an open hand when it comes to uh, and, and look, I know the Bible says if man uh, won't work, he shouldn't eat. Some of the people that come to me, it's not a matter of not wanting to. At least in the last administration, it was a matter of finding a job. Uh, and, and nowadays, you have, have a lot of people, it's not a matter of finding a job, or at least it wasn't until these last couple of months. Uh, it was a matter of they're not prepared for the kind of jobs that are available. They would actually have to go to school, get some training, and and since we don't believe in on-the-job training these days, the only thing they might be able to do is work at McDonald's. Well, we understand that McDonald's is an uh, entry-level job, therefore entry-level pay. Entry-level pay is not designed to uh, provide for a living, for a family. It's uh, really meant for teenagers and things like that. And that doesn't mean an adult can't do it, but that kind of a thing. So I'm not as worried about whether or not they're working as much as if they're willing to do what they can to get the rest of the money. I want to have an open hand. We're going to take care of the financial aspect as soon as we can. And then we use that to jump into sharing the gospel with them. We don't make them listen to the gospel first and then depending on their attitude, maybe we'll help them. No, we want to help them. And then if they don't want to listen to the gospel, they can leave but we try and use it as a springboard into the gospel. In Matthew chapter six, verses two through four, uh, it basically teaches that we need to do charitable deeds in secret. And though I've been talking about the benevolence ministry, it is a ministry of the church. It is done between uh, me and the person that's there. 
Uh, I don't uh, share everything with everybody, but speaking about the ministry is not uh, doing it uh, openly. It is still a secret thing. Uh, many of you give towards the benevolence ministry, and uh, I don't know who most of you are, uh, but I know that it is appreciated both by the church as well as by the people that uh, uh, receive it. So uh, doing charitable deeds in secret. In Galatians 2.10, it tells us to remember the poor. So with that in mind, when we think about how these ri wicked rich people got their money, we come to ver uh, number two here. We see that the rich people were exploiting the poor. First of all, they're withholding pay, not just delaying the payment. You know, it's a... Uh, Within business, there are, uh, you, you uh, give an invoice or a bill, if you will, and then a lot of companies, they operate on a 90-day schedule where within the next 90 days, we're going to pay it. That would be delaying the payment. In this particular case, you go ahead and send the bill as many times as you want. Uh, we're not going to pay it, even though we righteously owe the money to them. So that's what they were doing. They were getting rich by not paying the ones that they should have paid. And uh, for uh, the agricultural society, the day laborers, they work today for tomorrow's food. So if you don't get paid today, there's no food for the family tomorrow. Uh, and then of course in Leviticus 19, 13 and 24, 14 to 15, uh, God has a lot to say about uh, no oppressing laborers. A laborer is worthy of his hire, the New Testament teaches. And so as we have uh, the ability to do that, we're supposed to be paying those that we owe. Uh, in this particular case, they were not. Uh, there are two witnesses against these rich, uh, wicked rich people. There we go. We got the words in order now. Uh, first of all, we see that uh, James personifies the pay. Uh, the pay is, cries out. Uh, the word there is kradzo, uh, to croak as a raven, or scream, to call aloud, to shriek, to exclaim, to entreat, to cry out. Uh, I know most of you have probably heard the, the caw, 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 that kind of a thing when a crow or a raven is around. Of course, now we have the battle hawks in uh, St. Louis and uh, when I listen to sports radio, the, there's one guy on there that's constantly doing that. And it's kind of like, oh, it, it can be a little irritating. Well, that's the idea here where the pay is crying out. It's uh, making it uh, loud enough so it can be heard. Uh, not only is the pay personified crying out, but the reapers, those that were actually doing the work, they're crying out. It says the reapers' cries have reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. Uh, the word Sabaoth here is of Hebrew origin. Uh, that is Sabaoth, um, armies. Uh, Sabaoth, a military epithet of God. And it basically means the reaper's cries are reaching the ears of the uh, Lord of the armies of heaven. So th this is, again, one of those situations where you think you're getting away with it. God knows. He hears the cries of the people that are being exploited by these wicked rich, rich people, and he is going to deal with it. So that brings us to letter C here. Their wealth was self-indulgently spent. Wow. So first of all, they got a lot of it. Second of all, they got it through wrong means. And then third, we see they're using it to live extravagantly. And again, this is at the cost of others. Uh, that This is where the real problem comes in. I don't know if you've uh, watched any of the reality shows uh, that are on TV. I, I'm not big into those kinds of things, but whether it be the Kardashians or Jersey Shore, or there's a couple of others where all, they put all these people in one small area and uh, lots of things that are not pleasing to God happen, I'm sure. But they're, they're living pretty 
wow, nice yacht and, and all that kind of stuff. And that's the thing that God is sitting there saying, it, it's not a matter of having the yacht. It's not a matter of having the nice house. It's because you've gotten that money that you've gained that money through this wrong means. And then you're just really living extravagantly on it. Uh, it just makes it that much worse. Notice he says, you have lived on the earth in pleasure and luxury. Uh, the word for pleasure there uh, is uh, true fao, uh, to indulge in luxury, to live in pleasure. I'll move the notes down here for you. It is only used here in the New Testament, and the related noun has the basic meaning of softness. Uh, I don't know about you, but uh, I grew up, uh, the thread count on my sheets was probably 100, and now I think I'm doing good because I might have 300 uh, threads per inch and that kind of thing. And I'm hearing about sheets out there that have uh, a, thro a thousand uh, threads per inch. And I'm sitting there going, wow, must be nice. And I, I don't blame those that can afford it. I I'm not worried about that. But that's the idea here. They're living in luxury and softness. And James' rebu rebuke is about living in luxury, again, notice, at the expense of others. You know, if you're, if you're worth $60 billion, obviously you're not going to be living in a clay hut someplace. But if you gain that $60 billion on the backs of people that you have not paid, that you have not treated properly, that is where the problem comes in. The next word uh, for uh, luxury is uh, spatalao, uh, to be voluptuous, to live in pleasure, to be wanton. It is used here and in 1 Timothy 5, 6. It has the connotation of giving oneself to the pursuit of pleasure. The person who pursues pleasure and luxury, luxury often descends into vices in the vain effort to satisfy their insatiable desires. You know, when you think of Daniel and his buddies, they, here they're brought over to Babylon and they are given a certain diet and they refuse that diet. They make an appeal that they're allowed to eat vegetables. And of course, the eunuch that was in charge of all this, he knew if they show up in front of the king and they look sickly, he's gonna be in trouble. And so they say, hey, let us try it for so many days. Now, what was wrong with eating the king's meat? Well, obviously that meat may have been offered to an idol and that kind of thing. Uh, that might all be part of the issue. But the reality is when you get used to living in this exa uh, uh, extravagance, in this luxury, you, you will compromise uh, your person so that you may continue to do so. Uh, they wanted to be God's people in that situation, and therefore they weren't willing to compromise themselves. And God also blessed their efforts by making sure that when they were tested 30 days later, they looked better than the guys that had all the protein and stuff like that. Uh, so when you compromise yourself, uh, following your insatiable desires, you usually enter into all kinds of other vices that go on with it. First Timothy 5, 6 actually says that they are dead while they live. Now, I, I recognize the verse is talking about women, uh, widows uh, who are younger than 60. Paul says, look, if you're younger than 60, go out and get married, have kids, uh, that kind of thing. Because if you dedicate yourself to praying and serving the church, and then all of a sudden your desires get the better of you, you're going to be dead while you live. You'll physically be alive, but spiritually, you'll be chasing after stuff that isn't wrong in and of yourself, of itself, but you've made this commitment to the church, and you'll be going against it. You'll be going against God at that situation. So that's what happens to people who live in softness or pursue pleasure. It says here that uh, you have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. Uh, the word fatten here is trefo, to stiffen, to fatten, to cherish with food, etc., to pamper, to rear, to bring up, to feed, to nourish. And again, the whole idea here is 
taking care of yourself in such a way that all of your uh, delights and uh, everything is taken care of. And uh, what you're actually doing is preparing yourself for the day of slaughter. James warns of a coming day of slaughter. And the idea is a frightening picture of judgment. Uh, the day was going to come when they were going to give an answer for the way they had done business, how they had used their profits, etc. Letter D, their wealth was ruthlessly acquired in verse 6. Uh, he says, you have condemned and you have murdered the just. The word for condemned here is kata dikadzo, uh, to a judge against, to pronounce guilty, to condemn. Now, who are they doing this to? Notice it says they did this to the just. We'll see that in just a moment. How do you condemn a just person? Well, all we have to do is look around in our society today. First Amendment says that we have the freedom of religion and to practice that religion. And you've got police officers going to parking lots and spreading nails. You have police officers giving tickets to people who go and do a parking lot service where they're following all the social distancing rules, but they're doing something that some authoritarian person doesn't want to happen. That's the idea here. They've judged just people as being guilty. In this particular case, not only did they condemn them, but they murdered them. Now, the word here is phoneuo, uh, to be a murderer of or to kill, to do murder, to slay. It's translated in the New Testament every single time as murder. This isn't negligent homicide or anything like this. This is you went there, you, you pulled the trigger, you meant to kill him, and you did so. Uh, that's the idea here. Apparently, the rich were using the legal system to, do, to judicially murder some of the abused poor. Probably those who may have said, look, I did the work. You owe me the money. How come I can't get my money? Well, let's get this guy out of my face, uh, throw him before the court, uh, frame him, have him suffer the punishment uh, that comes with that. And so they were actually uh, guilty of murder, James says here. Uh, when we look at the concept of the judicial system, the judicial, judicial system or judges and courts, they were established by God. Uh, they were to be fair, impartial, and they were to dispense justice. You can look at Deuteronomy chapter 17, verses 8 through 13. Judges, the actual people that were in charge of this, were not to be greedy. Why? Well, if they were greedy, they were going to be open to bribes. And you see in Micah 3.11 and 7.3, they were not to take bribes. Uh, they were also to uh, not to show partiality. They shouldn't give in to a rich guy over a poor guy, that kind of a thing. Uh, or give in to a white guy over a black guy or anything like that. They were not to tolerate perjury in Deuteronomy uh, 19, 16 through 20, and the, like I said earlier, or take bribes. Uh, Israel had a difficult time with this. In Amos 5, 12, it says, For I know your manifold transgressions and your mighty sins, afflicting the just and taking bribes, diverting the poor from justice at the gate. Kind of like, you're here for justice? Go away. We're not going to give it to you. That kind of a thing. Or how about Amos uh, uh, 5.15 again? He says, hate evil, love good, establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Uh, the idea of Amos is telling him, you're, you're having this problem with injustice in the court system. Straighten it out, and maybe God will have mercy on you. Because if you don't, it's coming. It's coming. Uh, in James 2.6, uh, James says that you dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts? Uh, in this particular case, they were having the poor people sit on the floor, and they were giving the rich people a good seat, that kind of a thing. Uh, and we've talked about that already. 
So the judicial system was meant to be fair, impartial, and dispense justice. And here these wicked rich people were using the judicial system to get their way, to not have to pay their bills, to even have the poor people, the laborers murdered. Notice number three, the just, he does not resist you. So who is this just one? Well, the word there means the righteous ones. It denotes someone that is morally upright, someone who has done the things that they should have done. It's interesting that James's nickname was James the Just, something that maybe some of you didn't know. And James is stating that the victims were innocent of any crime or wrongdoing. So obviously, with these wicked rich people, and again, these wicked rich, rich people, they're in the church. So their faith, their professed faith, is not being shown forth in the way they are treating other people. Uh, notice he goes on to say, he does not resist you. This is referring to the just one. Uh, and like Jesus, uh, who when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten found in 1 Peter 2, 23, they had committed themselves to him who judges righteously. Um, there, there is a part of me that wants to rebel. And there's a part of me that recognizes, I have to ask myself, is this what Jesus would have us do? And there are times when I see Jesus in uh, uh, John chapter 2, he stood up, made himself a whip, flipped over tables, did what we might consider civil disobedience or rebellion. Uh, obviously, it wasn't sinful. He did uh, the right thing at that point. And there were other times when James and John, uh, the sons of thunder, hey, this guy did this. Let's just call down lightning upon him. It's kind of, whoa, calm down, boys, uh, that kind of a thing. So uh, obviously, in this particular case, the just ones felt as though the best testimony they could be was to not revile in return. Uh, they committed themselves to him who judges righteously. Look, again, it's not sin to be rich. In 1 Timothy 6, 17 to 19, Paul says, command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty. See, the haughty one is the one that won't pay his bill. He's the one that will have the innocent person uh, put to death so that he doesn't have to be reminded. But the rich that are saved, they shouldn't be haughty. And they shouldn't trust in uncertain riches. <laughs> I don't know about you, but if you have any kind of portfolio uh, in the stock market over the last several months, uh, you've seen uh, the last three years, wow, it's done wonders. And then a couple of little announcements and bing, bang, bong, boom lose about 25%. Riches are uncertain, and rich people shouldn't trust in uncertain riches, but they should put their trust in the living God who gives richly all things to enjoy. One of my arguments for not eating shredded wheat all the time. I can have Cocoa Krispies. Why? Because God has given us all things to freely enjoy. Now, it's not that I should enjoy Cocoa Krispies all the time, but at least once in a while, it's not a bad thing. He goes on to say, let them do good and, and that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves, again, that lay up your treasures in heaven type thing, a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. Now, obviously, this is not talking about earning salvation by giving, but uh, it is the idea that when they get to heaven because they've laid up treasures in heaven, the eternal life that they're going to experience, they will have rewards uh, based upon that. and It'll be that much better. Look, I know there are people in our church that make good money. And I know there are people in our church that financially struggle. And can I tell you, the ones that are financially struggling here would be rich in another country. That doesn't mean that they don't have a struggle. It means God has blessed us as, an, as a nation. And the first thing we ought to be doing is, first of all, giving thanks. Second of all, 
seeing how best we might use that which God has blessed us with. In some cases, it might be helping our not as rich brother or sister in Christ deal with some of their struggles. Yeah, but there's no profit in that. It's not like investing in a mutual fund where I'm going to get more money later. Actually, yes, there is profit in that. The mutual fund will come due when you're in heaven, not here. And God doesn't take care of you here either. Obviously, he does. Otherwise, you wouldn't have that money. So brothers and sisters, though we may not be Bill Gates, we may not be Donald Trump, the reality is, is we're not to hoard. We're not to gain the, that which we get through uh, unrighteous means. We should be paying our bills. And if nothing else, we should be looking for how God would want us to use the blessings that he has put before us so that we would be honoring him in all things. It doesn't mean we have to give away everything, but it does mean we have to use what he has blessed us with so that he is honored, he is glorified, and in the process, we might find ourselves drawing closer to him because we're laying up our treasures in heaven. Well, brothers and sisters, that's James uh, 5, 1 to 6, dealing with the wicked, wicked rich person. Not everyone that's rich is wicked. Uh, you definitely don't want to be one of those people because if you are, one has to question whether or not you truly believe. But um, this Wednesday, I will be speaking again. Uh, we'll see you at 6.30. In the meantime, I noticed there was some bread there this morning. I imagine there'll be some more bread at the church tomorrow. So if you can stop in and pick that up, even if you're going around and passing it out with a, a face mask on and things that, like that. A lot of bagels, a lot of baguettes. And uh, God bless you. Have a good week. Uh, stay safe. Stay well. And if you do get sick, uh, go ahead and call us, your brethren, uh, for any kind of help you might need, some soup made or something like that, uh, ride to the hospital, whatever the case may be. Uh, we want to show forth our faith in all that we do. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you again for your love, for your care, for the things that you have blessed us with. Give us grace that we may use those things in a way that's honoring and pleasing to you. Uh, give us grace to lay up treasures in heaven and not just worry about the life here, but knowing that someday as we uh, reign and rule with Christ, the things we do here do affect uh, that. Thank you again for the privilege of uh, being stewards in your kingdom. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. You are dismissed. Have a God-honoring week. Amen.